His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host, and our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. How does a handsome, dashing son of a preacher, son of the North Shore, wind up being a hero in a war? He's a man who's always planning, always thinking, and conspiring, so good at what he does that they put him in charge of the culper spiring. He's got a mind for battle. He's got an eye for ladies. Everything he did we should remember till this day. He's not a household name, but I think you'll be impressed. To learn it all, let's turn it over to today's very special guest. I'm Richard Welch, and I'm an historian and author. Um, I taught at Farmingdale State, LIU, and I just left a uh, tenure as a trustee at the Suffolk County Historical Society. I live in Northport. Great. And welcome back, we'll say. Thank you again for, for joining us to talk about your work in, in Long Island history. Uh, we're on Libsyn Connect tonight. And we're, we're heading back to the Revolutionary War, and we're going to talk about research you've done. But just as a historian who's focused on Long Island, do you have a favorite time period of Long Island? Do you think of it that way? Uh no, I guess there are different time periods that, you know, really attract me. Um, but I would guess the Revolutionary War period has to be one of them. And then um, I jump into different things, 19th century, um, early 20th century. Haven't done anything with late 20th century, i got to say that. Okay. But we are talking today about a man you call Washington's commando. I call him uh, our hometown Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's not bad. He wasn't that political, but... Right. In, in some ways, I guess. But Benjamin Talmadge, those who know the Culp Spiring will know the name, but how would you give us a, a just an outline of, of the man himself? Well, uh, he's a man of many talents. He is, of course, probably best known now for the Culp Spiring, particularly since the TV show Turn. Uh, but uh, I thought that his Revolutionary War career really encompassed a great many things. He was uh, involved in uh, major battles. He was also almost continually involved in uh, reconnaissance, uh, skirmishing, fighting with guerrillas. Uh, he was also involved in conducting raids from uh, rebel-controlled Connecticut primarily onto Long Island. And um, late in the war, he really ran almost a small navy in the Sound trying to interdict trade uh, between the British-controlled or largely controlled island and Connecticut. And of course, at the same time, he was uh, really the guy who was running the Culper Ring, although I should point out that the Culper Ring wasn't the entire you know, scope of revolutionary espionage, and they weren't the only men and possibly a few women that he had working for him on the island and also in the city. There are some who just don't fit into the ring, and Washington had other sources as well. It's a little bit more, let's say, uh, dispersed and less organized than names like the Culper Network or the Culper Ring would suggest. Sure. And we should also mention what he was in his mid-20s when he was doing all this. Uh, yes, he was. He, uh, he spends most of his 20s in the uh, uh, service of the Revolutionary War. He, uh, the war ended when he was about 29. Okay. So and to go back to the beginning, so he was born in Setauket. His, his, at least his father's side of the family came through Connecticut, I believe. Yes, that's where that branch of the Talmadge is. There are other Talmadge families on Long Island, but that's where his came from. So when we talk about Setauket, this area, and, and the Talmadge family, as the rebellion was fomenting or you know the, the ideas of independence, how would you characterize his family's views and, and maybe the area's views, if you could? Well, uh, generally, Suffolk County and even into eastern um, Nassau, they were settled primarily by people from New England. I mean, other people, uh, you know, came in as well, and some Dutch families moved out. But they're mostly from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And most of these people were uh, members of 
one Calvinist church or another, either they were Presbyterians as they increasingly became, some of them were Congregationalists, but they were all Calvinists. And this was a religion which tended to be a very Whig, that's with an H. And they were responsible really for the political party, which was most opposed to royal control. And in fact, in the mid uh, 17th century, they were uh, frequently involved in anti-royal revolutions, which uh, briefly was uh, successful. So he probably grew up in a family which was a skeptical about royal control and very jealous about individual rights or what they would have seen as their rights as Englishmen. And um, his father was a, a minister, had trained at Yale University. Both Harvard and Yale were originally designed primarily to produce Puritan ministers. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that he would have had this uh, political inclination. And so when the troubles really got between the mother country and the colonies really got intense, uh, that would have been uh, his instinctive, you know, direction for support. And and he, he went off to Yale eventually, or at a young age. And we'll mention, I don't think it was his roommate, but we'll mention his um, companion in Yale is Nathan Hale, which will, will resonate when we get a little further into the story. Yes. Now, in, in preparation for this, I, I read your book, which is General Washington's Commando. It came out, I think, 2014. Sounds right. And and I read Talmadge's own memoir. He writes one towards the end of his life. Yes, he did. And it's amazing as you go through it, the steps of history that he was involved in. So if we start maybe with the, the Battle of Long Island, mm -hmm. and do you want to set the scene? This is sort of August 1780, uh, 1776. The British have arrived with their, their armada. Yeah, it pretty much was. I mean, it was the largest invasion force really before uh, the D-Day, the Normandy invasion in uh, 1944. Uh, what had happened was that Washington was able to force the British out of uh, Boston by fortifying Dorchester Heights. Uh, Talmadge is not involved in any of the fighting at Dorchester, but he is in a Connecticut regiment, you know, a 60-day, 90-day regiment commanded by a guy named Chester. And so he went down uh, to New York, uh, which was a very difficult place to defend against an enemy which had naval superiority. But uh, politically, uh, Washington felt that he had to try to defend it, even though he had misgivings. And so they had defenses on Manhattan Island. They also had defenses in Brooklyn uh, in an anticipation of a British assault through Brooklyn to get to the East River. And Talmadge is stationed at one of these at a place called Bedford Pass. Um, it takes a real act of imagination to see uh, Kings County and Queens County the way they were then, which was primarily farms with lots pastures and that kind of thing. And there were these roads which went through certain passes, which made it easier to go from, let's say, the Jamaica Plains, as it was sometimes called, and to get to the East River. Um, but what happened was that one of the passes, uh, the Jamaica Pass, was left undefended. Uh, this was a blunder, and uh, the British attacked on two fronts, one which was obvious moving up basically from the area around New Utrecht, Gravesend, but the other one went through the pass and collapsed the uh, rebel line and forced them back to these forts along the East River. And if there was ever a time the British were going to you know, suppress the rebellion, this would have been it. But the uh, British commander, William Howe, uh, decided to wait and uh, see what would happen. And the uh, revolutionaries were able to get across the East River uh, into Manhattan, and they escaped, at least for the day. And if we're taking his memoir at face value, he tells a story of, of evacuating, you know, one of the last people to leave Brooklyn and then remembering he left his horse on the, on the other side. Yes. And he goes back. Kind of a foolhardy thing a young guy would do, but he but he got away with it. So as we track him, you know, the army retreats up through Manhattan, up through Westchester. Well, one thing that, that I got out of learning more about all this was the area around Westchester is, is really a contested or no man's land of, of activity. The, the, the stage of the revolution in this upper New York area is not one that I was too familiar with. Can you describe a little like what the fighting or what the, that front became? 
Yeah, well, this is called the contested ground or the middle ground, sometimes the middle patent. And uh, after the Battle of White Plains, uh, in which Talmadge was uh, fully involved, which ended up to be another uh, revolutionary defeat, although uh, they did perform pretty well, at least at the beginning of the battle, uh, the British basically uh, set up a kind of defensive perimeters in Westchester, but they never, you know, uh, occupied the whole place. And in fact, they really don't even occupy all of Long Island, although it's often described that way. They're very strong in kings and queens, but their uh, overall occupation tends to peter out as you get into Suffolk. When they felt like it, they would launch uh, foraging uh, expeditions, but they didn't really have any forts uh, on the east end of Long Island after uh, their uh, fort at Sag Harbor was destroyed uh, fairly early in the war. But in terms of Westchester, uh, this was in some ways even uh, more elastic. And uh, Talmadge spends a great deal of time, particularly when he becomes a cavalry commander, which he does in uh, 1777. Uh, he commands a troop of cavalry in the Second Continental or Second Connecticut Continental uh, Cavalry. And he's dueling almost continuously with the different kinds of British forces who are also trying to probe into the area. And there are also these various bands of what you really would call, you know, brigands, uh, cowboys and skinners who supposedly favored one side or the other, but they would plunder you, you know, with um, their official enemies were not available. So he tries to suppress them as well. And he gets involved with uh, Delancey's Tory units, both Oliver Delancey and James Delancey. And also he has a brush with the, uh, I guess, more famous uh, Bannister Tarleton at Pound Ridge. Uh, in which Tarleton pretty much surprised the uh, the dragoons, and they were forced to beat a hasty retreat. Although the British later retreated themselves. I mean, and there's a lot of nasty, you know, small scale warfare. It almost never stops. Yeah, and you you mentioned he's in the cavalry. I'm not a military man at all, but he was a, a dragoon. Yeah, and you call him a commander. So, like, how how would you characterize what his role was? It seems like he was basically go out and pick a fight, or or go out and find somebody to fight. Well, the Dragoons, the Dragoons are supposedly heavy uh, cavalry who can also fight as infantry as opposed to light cavalry, which are not quite as well armed. But with American forces, it was always a little bit more haphazard because of the difficulty in getting supplies. Uh, and, and what they would be doing would, you know, sort of depend upon the circumstance. So uh, when he was in Westchester, he's trying to protect those areas which are generally speaking pro-revolutionary or under revolutionary control, defend against British excursions. When he was in the uh, Philadelphia campaign in uh, 1777 into 1778, a lot of time he was spent screening Washington's army. And uh, he was uh, involved in the Battle of Germantown, for example. And then he was involved again in these constant kinds of sometimes really brutal, nasty skirmishes, which don't even have names, uh, with his British opponents. And sometimes he's the hammer and sometimes he's the anvil. And where would you say, is there a moment you can say he comes to the the notice or comes under the eye of of the higher command? The first time that... Uh, we know that he actually met Washington personally, although he'd probably seen him on parade uh, before the British arrived, you know, before the Battle of Brooklyn, uh, was at White Plains. And uh, what was happening was that the, uh, the revolutionary forces were sort of entrenched, or at least fortified, behind lines on these hills just outside of White Plains. And Talmadge was on a place called Chatterton's Hill. And what was happening were that, you know, German troops, usually called Hessians, were uh, not only attacking their position, but they were working a way around their flank. And uh, Talmadge could see that the whole rebel line was in danger of being unzipped if they were able to do that. So he rides back to Washington's headquarters and informs him of this. And this is the first time we know that Washington would have uh, met him. And ultimately, the uh, the Germans and the 
the British uh, succeeded in flanking the lines and forcing Washington uh, to retreat. Washington, uh, when he was beginning the uh, campaign around Philadelphia, he called for the dragoons uh, to come and join you know, his army. They had been operating in uh, Westchester and Orange County before that time, and uh, he wanted to use them in the campaign, which uh, turned into the entire Philadelphia campaign. And uh, Talmadge gave him very good service, and he came to his notice, certainly a German town, when the uh, revolutionary forces, which uh, began the battle, you know, so promisingly were in retreat, and Washington uh, set Talmadge's troop to uh, try to put a line across the road to stop them from retreating any further. Well, they weren't going to be stopped that day, but uh, they would turn and fight another one. So certainly he was aware of him by that time. And the Continental Army isn't that big. And so when somebody, you know, comes to, you know, his attention, you know, this is something that a commanding general would know. And Washington, who as you probably know, had no natural children of his own. He liked to put together what he sometimes called his family, which were mostly young officers uh, who we relied upon. Hamilton was probably the most famous example of that. Yeah. And so in, in terms of that trajectory, Hamilton and you know th- those that were sort of Washington's, I don't know if they were attachés or secretaries, but do you, do you think Talmadge, did he have thoughts of that type of trajectory or because he stayed basically in the field, right? And we, we could talk about his espionage work. Do you think he ever wanted higher status or, or a higher rank than he lived through in the war? I suspect he wanted a higher rank. Ultimately, he became a lieutenant colonel, uh, but he seemed to be very content in doing the various things he was doing. So I don't know if he necessarily wanted to be an uh, adjutant or something like that. If he had been appointed to it, I'm sure he would have done it. But he was a guy who uh, did thrive in various kinds of actions. And I think he liked the play by play that was going on out in uh, the field. And and what strikes me, or I've seen this a couple of times, but in terms of his interest in Long Island and the conditions on Long Island and, and wanting to go attack Long Island and invade Long Island, do you give that more to his being from Setauket or did he see a military advantage like, you know, hey, let's go inv- invade Setauket? Or was it, did he have to convince Washington to, to turn attention to activities in Long Island? He didn't have to convince him except for certain operations uh, that Washington felt might be too risky because you'd have to cross the sound, carry out your assault, and uh, then be able to withdraw successfully. But uh, uh, Talmadge's interest is partly because, yeah, that's where his family and his uh, friends were located, and he knew the island, and he knew it, well, at least parts of it were under almost continuous British occupation, and even places where the British weren't there permanently. And as I said, they thin out as you get uh, more eastward. I mean, they do carry out various kinds of raids. They call them foraging. A lot of them are basically pillaging. Uh, they're quartering troops, you know, in houses, and they're demanding various kinds of payments, not all of which are. Uh, necessarily related to warfare. And so we thought that if he could upset their uh, dispositions and their plans, that this would prevent them from, uh, let's say, carrying out their work as much as uh, they would like to. And it could possibly weaken them, force them uh, to devote more uh, energies in a place which was not the uh, center point of the war, although it was, you know, significant. The British originally thought they could uh, supply their armies a great deal locally. Uh, They thought that would be true of New Jersey, and they thought it could be true of Long Island. It never really panned out. While they did get supplies from both places and elsewhere where they went, they also uh, were very, the main armies at least, were very reliant on an annual fleet, which was called the Cork Fleet. Uh, from Cork, Ireland, which brought over enormous amounts of provisions for them. Okay. And and so if we turn our attention to the Sound and Long Island, and a person I think, I don't know if there's been the definitive book on Caleb Brewster, but he's another player that, and I, I've, I've read that he was sort of the impetus or he had the, he, he went to Washington and said, hey, let's, you know, we can do some good work on Long Island in terms of espionage or, or intelligence gathering. Yeah, well, Bruce is an interesting character, you know, and he probably deserves a book, but I'm not sure there's enough, you know, material for a book solely about him, uh, which is true of a great many people. But um, he grew up on a farm in Seatorket or the Seatorket area, but very early, you know, he got involved in seafaring activities. So he was at home 
on the sound and the ocean, you know, as much as he was on land. He uh, was a member of the Suffolk County Militia, and he uh, joined uh, revolutionary uh, regiments. He was officially ultimately attached to a a New York artillery regiment. But most of the time, he is a whaleboat warrior. In other words, on these relatively small, but they could be as long as 20, 30 feet. Uh, Vessels could be equipped with a sail, sometimes a small cannon. And what he would do is he would attack British vessels on the sound. He also would try to get information from people he knew that he could rely upon, which is how he ultimately, he's believed to have, you know, suggested to Washington you could get information this way. But also because Long Island was trading heavily with the British in New York and Long Island farmers were going into the city, that they could be sources of information. They could bring it back from the city. And New York City, which was just Manhattan in those days and pretty much not much above Canal Street, uh, New York City was the permanent headquarters of the British. It was their nerve center throughout the entire war. So the idea, uh, he brought the idea to Washington. Washington originally gave it to somebody else. But Talmadge steps in because he knows most of these people and he recruits primarily from people he knows, particularly Abraham Woodhull, Brewster himself, uh, some of the other families that served as couriers later on, which uh, becomes, I suppose, very famous. Uh, Woodhull recruits uh, Robert Townsend from Oyster Bay. Townsend was a merchant. Uh, His uh, mercantile office was right next to Rivington's uh, Royal Gazette. There was a coffee house there, and it was like British officers are talking all the time. And so then they, they set up what, you know, was later called by historians the Culper Network. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in two directions, so we can we can pick a route because I think they happen pretty close in time. One is the Benedict, the Benedict Arnold story and Andre, and, and the other is the raid on St. George's Manor. So I, I don't know if you feel thematically <laughs> which one you want to tackle first. Uh, the Arnold story happens uh, first. The, uh, the Arnold uh, plot that you know was primarily a result not only of his intelligence work but also his counterintelligence work, and it is sometimes claimed that the plot, which involved the, the uh, British Adjutant General uh, Major John Andre, he was uh, the British Commanding General George Clinton's uh, adjutant. Um, he was. Um, in correspondence with Arnold. And, you know, the Arnold plot's been described many times and, you know, historians then and now, and I guess even people then, you know, kind of struggle to figure out why Arnold did what he did uh, because he was, at the time, probably the most famous and respected combat general at his field commander in the Continental Army, uh, particularly after Saratoga. But he became very disaffected. Um, He seems to have felt slighted monetarily and also uh, in terms of rank. And he entered into a correspondence with Clinton through Andre, and he uh, finagled, uh, I shouldn't say finagled, he asked Washington for command of uh, the post at West Point, which was key to the control of the Hudson River and American supplies. There were a lot of supply bases up there, particularly Fishkill. Anyway, and he was going to betray this. And uh, in order to uh, sort of firm up the final, I guess, preparations, Andre had to go and meet Arnold uh, along the banks of the Hudson, not at West Point proper, but across the river. And uh, he was brought up there on a British ship called the Vulture. And he meets with Arnold, and uh, Arnold gave him a lot of papers, you know, with maps, dispositions, you know, numbers of troops, you know, that kind of thing. And Andre then had to get back down the river, but the ship had sailed south because it was being hit by some uh, rebel artillery. And so Andre put on a civilian outfit, crossed the river, and he began to ride uh, south. And he was stopped by a pro-revolutionary uh, militiamen in Tarrytown. Uh, they found the papers and they brought them to the headquarters of the uh, Second Continental Dragoons, which was then at uh, North Castle in uh, northern uh, Westchester County. And uh, the guy commanding there was a uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jameson. Talmadge was actually down on a, re- a sort of a reconnaissance raid fairly far south in Westchester. He comes back. And what happened was that Jameson did not 
appreciate, you know, what he had. He saw the papers and he realized, you know, this is kind of suspicious, but he decided that he would uh, send the papers that they found on Andre, who was calling himself John Anderson. He would send the papers and this guy who calls himself John Anderson to Benedict Arnold at West Point uh, because he was the local commander. And uh, Talmadge comes up and he smells a rat because uh, he's been doing a fair amount of espionage himself by this time. He looks at the papers. This doesn't look right at all. And um, exactly what he does next is slightly opaque, although it seems pretty clear that he's arguing with Jameson. You've got to call this guy back. I mean, you know, Washington has to look at this. You know, we, we can't. Where did he get these papers? And ultimately, what he was able to do was to convince Jameson to go halfway. He would call for Anderson. Andre to come back. He was brought back, but the papers went on to Arnold, and Arnold saw once he saw that you know uh, Anderson had been captured, he took off. He got on um, basically you know a, I guess a luxurious barge, and he went down in the uh, sort of refuge on the British ship. Uh, while he's talking to Anderson, Talmadge is increasingly convinced that this guy is a military man, and ultimately Anderson has to write a letter to Washington in which he uh, confesses that he was Major John Andre. Had Talmadge, you know, been able to get the papers back, they might have got Arnold, but they had to be satisfied with Andre. And this was an enormous jolt uh, to the Patriot cause because Arnold was held in such um, esteem. Well, the two layers that I got from reading your, your work and the memoir, and you tell me if this is part of the opacity, <laughs> one is that Talmadge knew Arnold from, from Yale, New Haven, and he always thought he was kind of sketchy. And two, it, it seems if you read between the lines that when Talmadge was arguing or debating with Jameson, Talmadge wanted to go arrest Arnold. I think he did, yes, or at least send uh, some of his troops to arrest him. Which is even more, you know, you think of the man the man of action, and he said, well, let's go just grab this guy, because some of the papers, I think, were even in Benedict Arnold's handwriting. I but they probably, yeah, they would have had to have been. You know, he probably recognized it. At the very least, what I think he wanted to do was send a guard. Maybe he wouldn't call it formally an arrest, but just make sure he wouldn't leave until Washington. Was, I think was he, he was meeting with the French in uh, Hartford, maybe Weathersfield, and he was on his way back. And so Talmadge wanted to make sure that Washington, you know, made the final decisions on this. But that would include where does Arnold fit? Well, and the other mic drop moment, after they know who Andre is, and Talmadge is sort of his companion, right, through a lot of this, he's he's in charge of watching him, or at least in contact. Yeah, he's in charge of the custody of taking him to its court martial, yes. And Andre asks, what do you think will happen to me? Because it's a possibility that he'll, he'll be treated like a spy. And that's when Talmadge says, let me tell you about my friend, Nathan Hale, who was famously hung as a spy. What can you tell us about that, the final fate of Andre? And Andre uh, was a very urbane, polished young man, and uh, he certainly impressed not only the British, but also the American officers uh, who often felt, you know, I think that maybe they weren't quite as polished as, you know, their British counterparts. And um, I think to a certain degree, not in the sexual sense, but that uh, he seduced them, hmm. you know, with his affability, his good nature, his education, you know, that kind of thing. And Talmadge certainly became very taken with him. Uh, he never, you know, dropped his guard or, you know, uh, shirked his duty. But he was, I think, very moved and very even, you know, uh, disturbed by his hanging. And he was there for the whole thing. Uh, you know, Andre was caught. He was a spy. He was wearing civilian clothes. He wasn't wearing his uniform. I mean, that was the penalty. Um, you know, I think they would much rather have gotten Arnold, but... Uh, as I, I think I wrote in the book, you know, one of them had to swing. And uh, since they didn't have Arnold, it was going to be Andre. And so the, the other path we were alluding to was so soon soon after this or a couple months after this is one of, would you say, one of Talmadge's most daring or at least well-known exploits when he invades the Mastic Peninsula and the Fort, the St. George Fort? Yeah, I would. Uh, it's probably one of the best known and certainly most dramatic. He also raided uh, Fort Franklin, or at least a, um, 
uh, the outskirts of it. He always wanted to go back and take Franklin. That was, you know, an itch he couldn't scratch. But uh, what happened was he got information, this seems to have come from Woodhull, uh, that the British, and by the way, these are almost always Tories, as I uh, think I also uh, wrote that. After 1777, almost all the British troops he's fighting are Americans. They're American uh, loyalist units. At any rate, uh, they put up a fort, which they call Fort St. George, they put it down at Mastic on the uh, the estate of uh, Judge Strong, who was a noted patriot. And they built, you know, pretty good stockade down there. And they also had access to uh, the Great South Bay and ultimately the ocean uh, through the Carmen's uh, River. At about the same time, the British were storing up, you know, a huge supply of hay for the winter. They they needed, you know, enormous amount of forage and also wood to burn. Uh, and they often got it on Long Island. That what they were storing up at Corum. So at any rate, Talmadge went to Washington and he proposed a raid. And this would be, you know, fairly far to the east. And he'd have to cross the sound at one of its widest points. He'd have to go across virtually the entire island carry out the attack, come back, you know, and then maybe, you know, get the uh, hay, et cetera. And Washington originally thought it was just too much, too big a risk. You're going to get caught on this now because the British do have vessels going up. I mean, they're trying to control things too. Uh, so Talmadge took the initiative or the bull by the horns and he went over and he reconnoitered everything himself. I mean, I'm sure, sure he was, uh, you know, led by uh, his various uh, emissaries, as he sometimes called them, but he scouted the place out. And uh, he also checked out the uh, the hay supply or depot at Corum, and he goes back to Washington. And uh, Washington says, "Okay, you can do this, but the main objective is the hay at Corum. If you can take out the fort." So Talmadge, you know, uh, sets off, and uh, of course, in his mind, the big thing is the fort. They can get the hay on the way back. And he leads a force of approximately 100 men. Uh, some of them are his dragoons. They're also some uh, volunteers, patriot refugees from Long Island. They land uh, basically where uh, Mount Sinai is. They wait overnight because of rain. Then they cross the island. They got to the outskirts of the fort, you know, uh, fairly early in the morning. And very dramatically, they yell, Washington and glory as they storm into the stockade and they captured it pretty quickly, took a lot of prisoners, they got a lot of supplies, some of which they could bring back, uh, some of which they simply had to burn. They also burnt the supply ship, which was there, uh, waiting to take supplies off to the city. And then on the way back to the island, he sends the uh, brunt of his force with the prisoners and the uh, plunder, or should I say the spoils, uh, up to uh, Mount Sinai, while he and Brewster and about 10, 20 other guys ride into Corum and they torch the hay there. And then they all meet up and they made it back across the sound. They threw the whole thing in about 48 hours. And it's, he, he describes it pretty vividly in his memoir. So it's interesting to hear, you know, even down to the style of fortifications and the bayonet charge. This, this was all done. They, I think they famously also took the bullets out of their guns, right? They attacked silently. I don't know if they did that. Uh, what they did do is um, Talmadge set up a group of what you know were called pioneers or engineers, and they were hatchet men, and their job was to go in first, and they were going to chop down the doors, which they did pretty quickly, but one of the British sentries called out, and then they fired. So I'm pretty sure their guns were loaded. Uh, I think it was Talmadge's idea to initially storm the fort without firing shots, but once uh, the Tories in the stockade fired. That was, you know, over. All bets are off. Yeah. And so he was not at Yorktown, right? So if we want to just no. finish out the war, where, where did after that raid, was he still back on the Westchester border kind of? He's, he's on the Westchester border. He plans the attack on Fort Slongo. But when uh, it came time to lead the raid, you know, a young fellow by the name of uh, Lieutenant Lemuel Trescott, he came and said, please let me do it. And Thomas said, OK, but he does write a very interesting letter in which, you know, it's sort of like a primer on, you know, how you conduct a cross sound raid, you know, when you do it, when you uh, call it off, uh, how you surround the fortification and everything. And that went off pretty well. 
He spends a lot of time toward the end of the war, actually almost sort of a combination Marine and Admiral, because there was a lot of trade between Long Island and Connecticut. People on Long Island had British goods for which there was a great demand in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And of course, people in Connecticut and Massachusetts had lots of food and things like that, which the British wanted. And his role was to suppress this. And some of this led to, you know, really almost like pirate battles on the sound, uh, Brewster's involved and a couple of them. In fact, he was badly wounded in one. And it's during this time, he did plan what would have been his biggest raid ever uh, when the uh, British under a Tory commander named Benjamin Thompson built a fort in Huntington in the winter of uh, 1782. But he was defeated primarily by the sound uh, that you couldn't launch his ships. And and the other thing, so we, the French fleet off of Chesapeake Bay and, and the Battle of Yorktown, which effectively ended the war, but there were still some time before the British left. What, what struck me was that towards the end, Talmadge went into Manhattan. He was sent, or he has to go down under a flag of truce and kind of do some work. I just imagine what that must have felt like, walking out in the open in what was enemy territory. What, what was that part of his... Well, uh, this is shortly before you, the British were preparing to evacuate New York. I mean, there was first a provisional treaty of peace, then there was the permanent one. And for a while, Washington was very skeptical. But then, you know, he realized that the British had called off all offensive operations. Uh, they had already withdrawn uh, their forces from Savannah, Charleston, and they were preparing to leave New York. And so uh, Talmadge uh, went to... Uh, Washington. And he said, you know, maybe I should go in to the city and uh, make sure that our agents there, who are mostly pretending to be Tories or at least apathetic, uh, would not suffer any kind of retaliation uh, when the city came back under um, continental control. Well, I guess we can call it American control now. And Washington agreed. And the war was coming to an end. It was no more fighting at papers. And so he uh, crossed over the, the Harlem River and uh, rode down into a very devastated island because, you know, there had been uh, some fighting in the northern part of the island itself, severe fighting, in fact, around Fort Washington. Uh, The city had been burned probably by American agents uh, after uh, Washington was forced to retreat. And it was also denuded of virtually any kind of vegetation, which the British had used. But he went down there and it's an interesting story. He says a lot of people he knew who were Tories are pleading with them, you know, that, you know, they're not going to get hurt. Uh, but he does, he doesn't say who they were, but he goes around to different people and uh, he makes it known that these people are not to be disturbed because they've actually been uh, supporting the Patriot side, has dinner with the last British commander in North America, Sir Guy Carlton, and then returns to Washington. And I forget how many days or maybe a couple of weeks later, British pull their troops back to Staten Island and they get on their ships. And Washington, with a very small group of people, Uh, you know, marches triumphantly back into Manhattan. They're a small group of people because the Continental Army was so broke. They uh, discharged uh, everybody as fast as they could. And and just another touch point in history, Talmadge is at Francis's Tavern at Washington's Farewell. Is it true he's got the only... the only eyewitness account? It is, that's the only eyewitness account. Now, some other people may have, you know, mentioned it in letters or anything, but uh, that's the only one that's come down to us. So just, I'm going to use that for a second to jump into the research. So were you surprised when you when you took on the book project between letters and other sources? What, what could you say about what you found in, in the written record about Talmadge? Well, there's actually a great deal. I mean, for one thing, he was highly educated and he's involved in a whole lot of things. Uh, there are collections of his letters, various places, the Connecticut Historical Society is a large number of them, Litchfield, where he moved to right after the war and became a very successful vi- businessman, investor, etc. There are also the Washington Papers, the Library of Congress, all of which are online and uh, obviously have abundant uh, information there. I also uh, found occasional letters in different places, you know, which you wouldn't expect. And he shows up in memoirs occasionally of other uh, continental uh, officers. So you find a good amount. Uh, one of the things, uh, 
which uh, did impress me, and somebody asked me about this and when I did a talk on this, I don't know, a couple of years ago, how different are his memoirs, which he writes, you know, in, um, you know, the, uh, the late 1820s, early 1830s, different from his wartime letters. And the answer is they're, they're really, they dovetail very well. In other words, it doesn't seem like he's making very much up. There's occasionally places here and there where I think he's uh, remembering things maybe a little bit lo- the way he wished they were, but by and large, they match. So what would you, what picture of him would you paint in his later years? So he moves to Connecticut. He, and we should mention he marries William Floyd's daughter, right? So he, Yes, he did. What, how does he spend the rest of his... Well, uh, they, uh, during the war, he was all, we didn't, you know, mention this. And, uh, you know, it, it's a totally, almost a totally different topic. But he's very interested in, you know, what's going to happen after the war and how he's going to get on in life. And he was always a great networker. And he networks with people in Connecticut, particularly the Wadsworths and the Colts, uh, who have contracts with the Continental Army. They later have contracts with the French. Uh, Through him, he uh, gets involved in speculating in continental and state currency. He also was uh, able to get French letters of credit uh, when he particularly when He's sort of, you know, running these naval operations in the Sound when they capture a British ship or something like that. You take it into port and you can sell everything on it. And, you know, the profits are all distributed among those who took it. And he, being the commanding officer, got a nice piece of change. And so really in 1782, he's planning a store, which is also functions as a bank up in uh, Litchfield. And also, you know, he was a he was pretty much a ladies man as much as you can. You know, he doesn't say that much directly, except that he really enjoys the company of women. Uh, But you get the idea that, you know, he was um, pretty smooth. And he uh, met the Floyd girls in Connecticut. It's called William Floyd, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He fled Long Island, and they're up in Connecticut. That's where he meets uh, Mary, and they get married right just right after the war comes to an end. And then they move up to Litchfield. His store is very successful. He's also involved in land speculation and town projects, you know, that kind of thing. He becomes a congressman uh, from Connecticut with the Federalist Party. He becomes a member just as it's, you know, going into its uh, decline. But he was in uh, uh, he was in Congress for close to 10 years, uh, ultimately uh, left, b- continued to busy himself with business, became very religious. He's caught up in uh, what is called the Second Great Awakening. Uh, he has a fairly large uh, family, seven boys, two girls. I think two of the boys died before he did. A very respected fellow, and uh, you know, uh, gets involved in veterans affairs when Lafayette comes to visit the United States and he stops in Connecticut. You know, they have a, a warm renewal of friendship. So he, he knows a great many people. And I guess just for the people that have maybe been listening and hearing all the Hamilton echoes, the one thing that I think you mentioned and, and Talmadge takes pains to write is that he was very anti-dueling. He avoided duels or he knew that it was a foolish endeavor. Well, uh, uh, dueling became, you know, almost a fad among American officers, and people have different uh, explanations for it, one of which was the 18th century conception of honor. You can't let it slip. And it has also been suggested that American troops, particularly officers, were very conscious that the British looked upon them, you know, as sort of rural bumpkins and that kind of thing. So there's lots of references to slights being you know, settled, you know, with dueling and Talmadge thought this was, you know, a very kind of stupid and uh, wasteful thing to be doing. And um, he goes out of his way to say he never got involved in it. But he writes that after Hamilton was killed in the duel. With the, with the benefit of hindsight. Yeah, sure. So maybe as, as a way to sum up, um, do you feel how, how unique for someone of his station, maybe his education and drive? I mean, are there sort of regional Talmages in, in all parts of the East Coast or like where do you see him ranking in terms of impact and uniqueness? Oh, boy. Um, well, certainly there are a lot of, you know, uh, people in the Continental Army who have to do different things because it's too small. And uh, I shouldn't say it. Well, it what became too small. Uh, you remember at Yorktown, there were more French troops than American troops, which is often uh, overlooked, or maybe we don't want to think about it. But uh, he really is unique in some ways, I think, with the things he has to juggle. Some have called him, and I can't remember where I first saw this, I wish I could, uh, the Francis Marion of the North. But Marion was almost always a guerrilla, you know, a very good one as far as that's concerned. But um, he doesn't have, you know, let's say, 
the different uh, levels of experience that Talmadge did. And, you know, and, and he's, he is juggling, you know, an incredible amount of things. You know, it's amazing his time to go to dances and hops, which he loved. Is there something about his life that you weren't able to find out? Like, is there a clue or something that if you wish you could have uncovered? I guess if there's one thing, it's, you know, in, in many ways, it's the obvious one. And we touched upon it. What was he really planning to do with Arnold? What did what, what was he really, you know, saying to Jameson? He hints at it very broadly. And he talks to his daughter about it. And in fact, the manuscript of his memoirs, which is in the New York Historical Society, it differs in a couple of small respects. And one of them is a letter which his daughter uh, put in there in which she re- remembered what he said. And, based, and it looks like he's really saying he wanted to grab him, but Jameson wouldn't let him. I guess it also would be simply to fill out the uh, historical record. Who were his regular agents, you know, on the island and in the city besides the ones we know, that is the culprits? And that was Richard Welch, ladies and gentlemen, Long Island historian, past and future guest. We thank him for his time. His book we were referring to is Washington's Commando, and we will have links in our show notes where to find it, along with other resources related to today's topic. That's at longislandhistoryproject.org. And if you're interested in the Culper Spy Ring or any aspect of life on Long Island during the Revolution, we've got a whole curriculum of episodes in our catalog. Take a look. Everything from the Loyalist experience to fortifications on the island, various members of the ring, as well as the story of how their tale was uncovered through time. And whenever you think you know the story, there's more to find out. And if you have your own story to tell, if you've been diving into Long Island history or have a family connection to events, great or small, we'd love to hear from you. Get in touch. We're at Long Island History Project at gmail.com. That does it for another episode. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>